The Gran Turismo series has always been known for its wide variety of cars. Ranging from small economy boxes all the way to Le Mans prototypes, and even cars resembling disciplines like Formula 1. And out of all the games in the series, Gran Turismo 4 has always been my favorite one. With over 700 cars and a plethora of racing events to complete thanks to its wide range of racing circuits. Made even more impressive by the fact that the game is over 18 years old. Since I wanted to return to this game and do a playthrough on stream, I decided to do a challenge run, inspired by the increasing number of other content creators doing one as well. Here, I try to think of something simple, while not being too restrictive. This simple idea then manifested itself into what is essentially a greatly distilled version of the game. Road. Car. Only. As the name implies, I am only able to enter events in cars that are road legal. Any race car, as well as any wacky concept cars, are not allowed. Although this challenge will therefore be quite easy for me in the early stages, it will quickly ramp up in difficulty once we get closer to our main goal which is beating the Gran Turismo World Championship. This is where we have to battle all kinds of race cars, from GT1s to Group C Le Mans prototypes. Additionally, I also wanted to complete the All-American Championship and All-Japan Touring Car Championship, which puts you up against American and Japanese race cars respectively. Aside from this, anything related to upgrades and license tests are obviously unlimited, as these would make the challenge impossible otherwise. So with this introduction behind us, let us begin our journey towards answering the question whether Gran Turismo 4 is beatable using only road legal cars. First up, instead of completing the license tests, I instead decided to immediately buy a car from the dealership to begin the playthrough with. To start off, I had bought a Mazda RX-7 FC. This car turned out to be an awesome choice as it had good performance from the get-go as well as having a great tuning potential. Good fight, actually. Everybody doesn't catch me in a straight line, though. Ah, we're fine. We're fine. We win this. Let's go. After doing a few events, we eventually had to obtain our first license, in which we got all gold medals without many issues. There we go, that was it. After this, we were able to breeze past the first few challenges. However, after a while, the car did fall off into performance, culminating at a close loss at the Turbo Sports event. See, the Arctic's only. Bear overtakes only. I went way too deep and I still managed to make it. I could have punted him off, but I didn't because I'm a Giga Chat. Oh, that was the RX-7 in second place. Oh my god, we can actually do this. Hold on. I gotta break toe, I gotta break toe. Oh no, he's catching. No. No. <laughs> No, man. I just look at the look at the top four. Look at the top four. Speaking of this event, I first had to obtain the A license for this. Send it. Oh, Paolo, come on. Easy. Easy. Four tenths clear. Getting silver or better on this license also provides you with the Gran Turismo Nissan Skyline GTR, a 500 horsepower monster of a Skyline which can make light work of pretty much every early game event. However, to keep things interesting, I decided not to use it. After getting all gold medals on the A license, a viewer challenged me to get all golds on the IB license as well. Do now, Piper, Piper, gifted. You want, to do, like, you want me to do cone slalom right now? Or the whole license? Or the whole IB license? Okay, I'm gonna do that. The whole IB. Fuck it then. I'll do it. 
I had accepted the challenge, and to my surprise, everything went very well. Rosal's already an annoying one. It's uh, a trail breaking test. Oh, that was easy. At <laughs> first, I said that was going to be a tough one. Well, I guess not. Including the difficult slalom challenges. So it will just... You'll just spin out. Boom! Let's go! It was even faster than the last one. It was even faster than the, la than the first one. Oh, that feels good. But then, the game did this. It was gold. Oh, my controller. Oh, emula ah, emulation, emulation crashed. That means I have to do the slalom again. The game crashed right after the slalom tests, and I had forgotten to save the game at this point. And although I had made a save state before, it was unfortunately before I did the slalom tests. Oh my god, I'm all the way back to the freaking first lap guide run. That sucks. Oh No. Well. Guess the only thing I have to do is soldier on. Despite this, however, we still managed to get a gold time on both cone slaloms and get our IB license within an hour. Come on. Again, you We did it. That is obviously not true. And thank you for the five gift subs. Get you to your word. After doing a couple of more tournaments, including the ones outside of the main ones, like some specific Japanese ones, it was time for our first challenge, the Tuned Car Championship. This event puts you up against cars from various tuning brands, some of which being pretty much on the level as actual touring cars. However, with a lot of cash to spend and a well-tuned Nismo 400R, which we got from the 90s challenge, we were able to easily breeze past them and win every single race, therefore completing our first real challenge of this run. After this, I thought it was time to do a little bit of rallying, which is what we did in this blue Subaru Impreza. This specific Impreza was recommended to me by a guide video on YouTube, which showed that this car was capable to even outrace Group B cars in rally events. Although I did not test this, it was still easily able to beat out some of the easier rally events, in particular the race at the Grand Canyon, which gave us a car I really wanted to try, the Ford RS200. This road-going version of the famous race car was quite a fast one, made even better by the fact that it was red, which of course adds an additional 50 horsepower. This immediately gave me an idea. What if we try completing the All-American Championship with it? Sure, there are faster cars out there that we can use for this, but using a track-modified version of a car that was normally intended as a rally car could prove to be quite interesting. And oh my, it sure did. That's chicane here. But I don't think it will make it otherwise, yeah. It was not gonna make the final chicane. Even then it's a 133, so it's not that bad. Full nitrous. And we did the event with uh, a normal 4 hours 200 and we're 5 seconds ahead of a Corvette C5R, which is by itself a really fast car. <laughs> Okay, it's good to know that we are actually competitive with this thing. This is where I have to explain an important part of these challenge playthroughs. Car rosters. Every championship in the game has a certain pool of cars that can appear in an event. The All-American Championship, as the name implies, has a roster of American race cars. Ranging from iconic classic ones like the Trapparel 2J, up to some modern ones like the Chevrolet Corvette C5R. Although we'll be able to compete with cars like the Corvette, the ones like the Trapparel 2J would prove to be too fast to beat, due to having much more grip and power than me. This is where my trick comes in. Re-rolling. By abandoning the race and re-entering it, you will be greeted with a fresh list of cars, ready for you to race against. And since the car roster is bigger than 5 cars, you will be able to get a different set of opponents every time you enter the event. This therefore allows us to get a more favorable car roster, with the most important goal obviously making sure that the Trapparel 2J is not present. 
this was indeed the case after a few tries. But don't think that the championship was immediately a cakewalk for me. The Ford RS200 was quite bad on the tires, and due to having much less downforce than most of my opponents, had some issues keeping up in the faster turns. Despite the car's shortcomings, our small and nimble Ford RS200 was still able to comfortably win this championship, completing one of our goals. Boom. We did it. We did a championship in the game. Only a road car against race cars. That's the first one. Before continuing, it was time to now obtain our IA license which was actually not as hard to get all golds for as I expected it to be. The only real challenge was the final one with the Nissan R92CP, but we managed to complete the whole license in about an hour. Clearing the path for us to complete all the championships we still needed to do. Mom? Let's fucking go! Two attempts was all I needed. We did it. It was then time to move towards Japan, where the All Japan Touring Car Championship awaited us. Now, remember that Impreza that I was using for the rally events? Since it was so grippy off-road already, I decided to give it some power and handling upgrades and take it with me to battle the Japanese touring cars. I expected this championship to be doable. However, what I did not expect is how incredibly fast this car was. In the slipstream we go. Oh, but the Nissan 350Z is also coming into the party. Oh, look at the speed. Look at the speed difference. Easy pass. And we're in first place. At 119. In fact, this car was so fast that it ended up applying a few downgrades, like removing the exhaust upgrade to make it more competitive. Alas, it was still incredibly fast, so we flew through this championship with no problems at all, completing another part of the challenge run. We did it. All races with the Subaru. One hundred points. This then only left us with a few more championships in the beginner and professional leagues. After speedrunning the Compact Car Cup and Sunday Cup, which I had avoided early on due to giving terrible payouts, only two more championships were left, the Supercar Festival and that prestigious Gran Turismo World Championship. At this point, I was already thinking of cars which could beat the World Championship, as this was unsurprisingly going to be our biggest challenge of the whole playthrough. We therefore already tried a few cars, like the Dodge Viper SRT10, which despite its lack of downforce and high weight, still managed to be a very quick car, even proving to be quite stable through the corners. This therefore also allowed us to easily complete the Supercar Festival, leaving us with one more championship left to complete. Now, finding a suitable car for that World Championship was going to be incredibly difficult. First of all, every single race is between 50 and 60 kilometers, which is more than long enough to destroy a set of medium racing tires on pretty much any car, therefore requiring us to buy a car that at the very least did not shred its tires after a few laps. This also translates into having a car that is stable in the corners and is able to easily put down its power out of the corners. Speaking of power, we're going to need quite a lot of it. In fact, I suggested that any car that can't have more than 500 horsepower and achieve a weight of under 1300 kilograms would likely make this challenge impossible. And last but not least, we needed a car with downforce. This would therefore immediately make all cars which lack adjustable downforce and are unable to have a wing applied to them useless to us. Cars like the Celine S7 and Cizeta V16T could, for example, achieve sufficient power and weight numbers and can have a decent balance, but are unable to have a rear wing, therefore making them useless to us. However, cars like the Dodge Viper I used before can have a rear wing, making them much more viable but even with this rear wing, you can only increase the downforce level by 30 points at the front and rear, which is not even close to those Le Mans prototypes, which have more than double that at the front and nearly triple that at the rear. Lucky for us though, there are plenty of cars in the game which come with downforce by default, and adding a wing to them simply adds 30 downforce points on top of what they already have. For example, the Jaguar XJ220 already has some front and rear downforce, so if we add a wing to it, we can increase these values by 30 points on both the front and the rear, on top of what the downforce already is on the base car. 
However, after some testing off-stream, there was one car that I had found which was quite unusual in this regard. Enter the Nissan R390 GT1 road car. A road legal version of the iconic R390 GT1, which raced at Le Mans in the late 1990s. This car actually met our requirements for both power and weight, putting out over 800 horsepower while weighing under 1100 kilograms when maxed out. However, this car also accepts a wing upgrade, which is all completely fine, until I realized how high the downforce would go. Yes, you see this correctly, 70 front and 85 rear downforce. Apparently, the road going version is so close to the race car that it already produces a high amount of downforce when stock, and since the wing always adds 30 downforce on the front and the rear, I was able to increase the downforce levels to what I had just shown, effectively turning it into exactly what you would expect, a road legal Le Mans prototype. I then entered the Gran Turismo World Championship brimming with confidence, made even better by the fact that we immediately had a decent car roster. Although I did some testing previously and found out that you can get some very favorable car rosters in this championship, the one we had here looked challenging but beatable, with all but one car being a Le Mans prototype throughout the years. A Jaguar XGR9, Bentley Speed 8, Peugeot 905 and for that time modern, Pescarolo LMP1 car. Ironically, the last car in the field was the race car variant of the one I had, which actually turned out to be by far the slowest car on the grid, to the point where I was even able to lap it in a few races. However, not everything was sunshine and rainbows in this championship, something which I would have to find out the hard way. Oh no! Yeah, wait, we held it, we held it, we held it, we're gonna still drive. It's alright, it's alright. Nothing happened. Which it already does, so I'm gonna just pass him here instead. There we go. A little bit of an aggressive pass, but we'll do it anyway. I'll just go for it. Once you see the I once you see the chance, I'm just gonna I'll just I'm just gonna take it. Get oh no, don't spin again. No I'm an idiot. Oh no. I messed up the uh, unfortunate finish there. Uh, we could have done so much better there. And also I noticed that the Peugeot was much faster in, in the... Um, um, because of the tire management. Although I did a few laps of practice early on, what I did not expect is that this car is a complete death trap. Maybe modifying a road-going version of a race car to be said race car might not be very good for the car you're tuning. And as it turns out, the upgrades made the car incredibly nervous in high-speed sections, where the car had the tendency to violently oversteer, sending me straight into the wall and usually pointing the wrong direction. This problem became even more evident once we arrived at the Motegi Super Speedway. Entering either of the two bank turns would essentially cause the car to start sliding immediately, and we had tried many different solutions, even going as far as trying to find some good car tunes by other people, but unfortunately, nothing seemed to solve that issue. That was until I realized something. Maybe it's, maybe it's the front tires. I've just they, they just put like a huge ballast on the front tires, like 60, 70 kilos. Maybe it's the front tires that are the problem. Maybe the car just has like no front grip. Although, hold on a second. I think I may have found a solution. I think the ballast was a solution. Look at this. No, no spins. When I break, it's still spinning because I have no stability, but... It was the front tires after all that were the issue, not the rear tires. Wow. Simply put, ballast just puts an additional amount of weight into your car, which you can place anywhere to shift the weight balance. As it turned out, this car's massive rear weight bias made it incredibly spin-happy, so I had decided to place a hefty 60kg ballast at the front of the car, and to my surprise, this seemed to massively reduce the issue keeping the slides much more manageable and significantly improving overall stability. Despite my happiness and the car now being much better though, it still did not allow me to win the super speedway race as the car was still unable to carry enough speed through the bank turns. What was even worse though is that both races were won by the same car, the Peugeot 905, which proved to be a fierce competitor in the events thanks to its great tire management and good high speed acceleration and grip, 
and seemingly no big flaws whatsoever. And being 14 points down after just two races is definitely not a good outlook for the rest of the championship. But coming into the third race in Hong Kong, things started to change for the better. See how much slower I am. Oh, still faster actually. What? That's strange. I'm actually faster. <laughs> what? I did it too early to too late for the for your lap. Or I mean, probably because we're like the first one to set a lap, but I'll make use of it as much as I can. First off, I have managed to put my car onto pole position with a lead of almost five seconds. I had then managed to absolutely destroy the opponents in this race, finishing way more than 10 seconds ahead of second place. Oh, it's kind of floaty. There you have it. GG! Race number 3 is actually a victory. Even better was the fact that the Peugeot had a poor race, finishing in 5th position, allowing me to get a lot more points on it than I had anticipated. Then it was time to go to another city track, Seoul Central. This was actually even easier than the race in Hong Kong, with the long straights and sharp turns allowing me to gain a massive lead over the other drivers. Additionally, the Peugeot 905 had a rather questionable strategy, pitting in right before the final lap, therefore being down into 5th position. This immediately therefore brought us back into the championship, pretty much tied on points with the Peugeot 905. Bad first two races, but now we're having a back-to-back -back race victories, let's go! We're one point in the lead, let's go. We're one point ahead of the Peugeot. Two points ahead of the Pescarolo and like very far ahead of the Jaguar. These two races therefore have put me right back into the championship contention, allowing me to regain hope that I can still pull out a win and finish this championship in a single attempt. And in general, they have shown that I had a huge advantage on the tighter circuits with this car. However, one of the problems I had throughout all these races was tire wear as I had to use a harder compound for the rear tires, and even that was sometimes not enough to stick to a one-stop strategy, which is arguably the most efficient way to complete the races in this championship. And this truth would almost smack me in the face once we arrived at the fifth race in El Capitan. A fast paced but also a very bumpy and undulating track, therefore being able to easily shred your tires in a few laps. Qualifying when as expected, giving me an easy pole position by trying on some softer tires. First place on the pole. We have pole position. However, the race was all but a done deal. It was incredibly difficult to keep up a good race pace while also not completely destroying my tires. This culminated when my main rival, the Peugeot 905, had made its pit stop, getting back on track only a few seconds behind me. However, the Peugeot had fresh tires, while mine were almost completely gone. This then led to what I can only describe as the two most difficult laps I have ever driven in this game so far. Uh, somehow I need to get this guy behind behind for two more laps where the tires are dying very quickly. So if he is four seconds ahead behind at the start finish line, we're good, we're good. And we're golden. I got that really good problem, I don't have focus, that's not good. Nine seconds, we're actually gaining even more time, but I feel like the rear tire is going to step away now. Oh, it's racing right now, just like the car is. Yeah, we're driving on ice for real now. Yeah, he's catching up quickly. Oh no. 3.8, but I can hear him behind me. With this, like, fast right hander. Just left turn and then I'll just pass right hander and fuck fine. 
I think we're good. I think we're in the clear. I think it's the last final lap. Come on. Oh my goodness. That is a huge relief. 1.6 ahead of the Peugeot. Despite the fact that it felt like I was driving on ice, we had managed to stay ahead of the Peugeot and snatch our third win in a row, allowing us to take the lead in the championship. This lead was then extended as the sixth race was in New York, another tight street circuit with two long straights, a perfect track layout for our car. Once again, after grabbing an easy pole position, we were able to easily complete this race, even lapping our real-life racing variant right before the finish line. Oh, we're actually gonna lap it. Come on, come on, come on. At the final lap, we're gonna lap our own car. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> we actually lapped him at the end. Oh, that's so, that's such a flex. We lapped the race car version of our own car. Look at this. Our now, once again, full of confidence, we headed towards Paris, where the final street circuit of the championship awaited us. But unlike the previous ones, this one was not only significantly more bumpy, it also featured a lot more low-speed sections, something which proved to be very difficult for us to negotiate through. Since the upgraded turbo also brought a lot of turbo lag with it, the car was either not accelerating enough out of these very slow turns, or would have a lot of wheel spin, both of which are obviously not favorable to us. And despite setting up the gears in such a way that this can be prevented as much as possible, we were still struggling a lot throughout this race, which also turned out to be another tire shredding event like El Capitan. Our... It's bit of time anyway. Look, look at this, the car is not getting anywhere. It's right on ice. No refueling, same tires, go. Yeah, tires are gone. Tires, now, now it's actually blown, my tires are gone. This tire shredding would also be shared by the opponents. As the Jaguar XGR9, which had already fallen off the championship due to its bad tire management, had to stop twice during the race, being one of the only cars to do so in the entire championship. Oh, oh! Wait a second. Hold up a second. The Jaguar spinning again. This has immediately turned into a race winning situation. We need to keep it in the leaf thermal lapse. Oh my goodness, I didn't expect- Since we did a one-stopper, and the last lap before our pit stop already proving to be a nightmare, we once again had to keep the Peugeot 905 behind for two more laps. We're gonna have to like, just keep it in like third gear permanently, I think. Look at that acceleration out of the corner, even the truck goes faster. We're driving a truck now instead of a car. Oh no. I need to have the speed. You back super early for the turnout, I'll spin. Oh no, he's next to me. He's next and he's past me. Yeah, that was a. Uh, that was not my mistake. Yeah, we're gonna be second. We have to concede the win here. I went into wide into that corner and then I gave him room. And I immediately took it. Unfortunately, with that mistake, we had no option then to let the 905 through, as it flew out of sight with its much better tires. Despite the loss, however, we still managed to grab second place, which is far better than I had expected considering how tough this track was to drive on. Although we had to concede first place to our main rival, we were still 8 points ahead. This meant that, in order to give ourselves a guaranteed championship win, we had to finish ahead of the 905 in at least one of the next three races. And with the next race being in Suzuka, this certainly started to look like our championship to win. Look at the exit speed that we have compared to these guys. Stick up the inside and at the, at the SS and we just go for it. The race at Suzuka turned out to be quite a decent one, especially when the Peugeot and Pescarolo LNP1 cars decided to inherit the strategy book of the Scuderia Ferrari team and pit right before the final lap. Unless it makes a huge mistake somewhere. Oh, it's pitting, it's pitting. We're fine, we're fine, we're fine. Don't spin the car. Now don't spin the car. Please don't spin the car, Bass. Don't spin the car, Bass. Don't spin the car. I'm gonna I'm gonna knock it on the knock on the table. I'm not jinxing myself. Do not spin the car. Don't spin in this corner. I'm gonna, make, I'm gonna do really slow. I'm gonna do really safe for this. Look at that. No need to 250. I did 200 there. That's got all behind us. That's it. I think it's the last lap. Maybe we can do one more lap. Get to one more lap easy on these tires. 
Boom! Let's go! That was an easy victory. Because of the last lot pit, pit stop that they have to make. And the Peugeot is actually in third place, which is perfect for us. But look at the scores. 14 point difference. The, all we need to do to not mess up this championship is not become last twice in a row, which is physically impossible. We have pretty much already won this tournament here. We are in the clear, essentially. Additionally, in this race, I did what is probably one of my best overtaking maneuvers I have ever done in this game. It's the first time I've ever seen a speed at first place in, ever, in any of these races in the tournament. Oh, look at extra speed, look at extra speed. Round the outside! Oh, <laughs> that was disgusting! No, don't bump me out of the race, please. Don't bump me up. It was so disgusting that the AA almost, almost killed me there. Oh, that felt so good. I was like on the edge of the- I was like on the edge of grip there on the outside. The penultimate race was at another great track, Grand Valley Speedway. If we wanted to secure the championship here already, all we needed to do was to finish at worst one place behind the 905. And just like the previous race, we look to be unstoppable. Full boost for the end. Boom, first place. Alright, let's go. I'm ready. Oh, the excess speed. Look at the excess speed. There we go. Easy pass. Are you already hunting down that Jaguar in the front? Oh, but look at the excess speed of this car! <laughs> Disgusting launch speed out of that corner right there. It's like it's warping. It's like it has no chance. Despite some mistakes during the race, we have managed to keep it ahead of the XJR9. But once you came into the pits, the Peugeot and Pescaolo were still driving on for a few laps. That was until this happened. Oh, the Pescaolo's having trouble. Oh, look at this, they're spinning! They're spinning! Oh, sorry. They're spinning completely. He's, he is off, he's, he's completely turned around! <laughs> The guy was complete. He was completely turned around because I bumped that thing off the track. I mean, we know for sure we're gonna be winning now. Okay, that, that's it. We, we we finished these two laps. We've done the championship. The Peugeot was done. The Peugeot's done for it because he ha he has to pit and he also spun around. The Peugeot completely spun around and I have spun him again by just bunting him off. Hello, Trevor. <laughs> okay, we win, we win. This is it. We we got it. As it turned out the AI had overcooked their tires, which caused both of the lead cars to spin out. Additionally, thanks to my little love tap on the 905, I had caused it to spin again, making it lose even more time. This all but sealed the deal for the championship, especially since the Peugeot ended in 5th position. This therefore gave us a 22 point lead, and with one more race to go, we had secured our world championship victory. Through the hairpin for one more time we go. Crowd is roaring. As we are going to take victory, I think number five. And with that, the championship. There is no way we can lose a championship now. Especially because the Peugeot is in fifth position. One more race to go. We are now 22 points ahead of the Peugeot 905 race car, but there was still one more race to go, taking place at Le Mans. And although I could technically skip this race now that we have already won the championship, I thought it would be a good idea to do this race as a sort of victory lap. Aside from having a um, small off-track moment in practice... No track limits there, it's all fine. Oh Jesus. Ow, and we're dead. And that is how cars used to crash in Group C in Le Mans in the 1990s. I had reduced the car's downforce to see if we could reach over 400 km per hour on the Mulsanne straight. Additionally, I had simply equipped the car with super hard rear tires and would just cruise towards the finish line. And with the help of some slipstream and nitrous, we indeed reached 400 km per hour. And have a look at the top speed run of this car with slipstream, let's see how fast we can go. Oh god, it's flipped of course. Oh look at the speed, look at the speed. 350, 360, 370, 380, come on, 400, 400, with nitrous, 
Boom, 400, let's go! After that, we simply cruise towards the finish line of this final race, with us coming out victorious and becoming the Gran Turismo World Champion. Coming home in 4th place for the final race, but it does not matter anymore. Because we are... going to be crowned... the Warface... the Warface... <laughs> the Gran Turismo 4... World Champion. It's over. The challenge was complete. We had beaten the game using only road legal cars. Additionally, we have proven that other race car focused championships, like the ones we did in America and Japan, are also doable with a tuned road car. Although we could have continued from this point and done some of the extreme events like the All-Star and Dream Car Championships, I will instead think of a new challenge run, as this one has been the most interesting and fun playthrough I have ever done in this game so far. And who knows, maybe I'll prove Eden wrong and complete a world championship in a used car. Or maybe one of you who is watching this video right now has a great idea for a new challenge run. If so, let me know in the comments or on my Discord server. But that will have to be a story for another time. If you would like to see how this story unfolds, however, you may want to watch the challenge live on my Twitch channel. You can find the link in the description, as well as the link to my Discord server. I also hope you enjoyed watching this video, as this is something that I don't usually make on my YouTube channel. If you did, make sure to like the video and subscribe to see more like this in the future, or dislike if you didn't, of course. But now it's time to prepare ourselves for this next challenge, and all that's left for me to say is that I would like to thank you for watching, and as always, have a great day. Oh god, that's too wide there. Dorifto!